Some of you, uh, some of you were at our satsang last night in uh, Pune City, and I was I w I started to think of a topic last night or, or yesterday when I was beginning to talk think about the satsang last night. But because the time is limited at the satsang, I realized, oh, I'm never going to be able to say what I want to say, so I had to c condense it down. And I thought, well, but I, I did want to finish what I was saying, and so I thought, well, maybe I'll have more time here, and I'd like to continue what I was speaking about last night. And um, I, I won't necessarily go over all the stories again, but, uh, but uh, I started off by telling a story of Paramahansa Yogananda running into being in, uh, confronted by a fundamentalist uh, a Christian in America while riding on the train. And the, he got very, the Christian was very angry and was accusatory toward Master and said he was going to go to hell. And uh, Master replied, said, well, I may get there by and by, but uh, you seem to be there already. <laughs> and because the man was red in the face and he was so angry, and everybody in the train started laughing at this fellow. And my master had a very quick wit that way. And this is something that I think is um, prevalent. Perhaps it's prevalent in every age. I don't know. I live in this age, so I don't know. But, but it seems to be something that you find in, in it's not confined to Christianity, it's not confined to uh, Islam, it's not confined to Buddhism, but you find fundamentalism, and we're living in a world today that has a lot of it and some of the very negative repercussions that's happening in the world today because of fundamentalism. And I think fundamentalism really, it, it's something that comes when people feel they're under threat. Something is threat. Things are changing in this world very rapidly. But of course, if you look back in time, things are always changing. But as things change, there's a reaction to that, and people hold on to their things that have made their life secure. But we know that everything changes. And this is why when Master was asked by Swami, is this a new religion that you're bringing? He's, he said, no, it's not a new religion because you cannot have a new religion. Truth is truth. And it's going to be expressed from age to age in new expressions. So he said it's a new expression. And this is something that as long as we have truth, as long as we have human society that is being changing continually, that truth has to be expressed in a new way according to modern times, according to culture, according to society. And so this is the role of the avatar. The avatar comes again and again. And it's inevitable, you could say, that this happens because at the same time you're having cycles of time, you're having Society is going up, your heaven society is going down, and inevitably you have this stress that comes in, and you have this, this, this situation of fundamentalism that takes place. And some of it is not bad in its own way. Swamiji said that in some ways, he said people accuse Swamiji of being changing, you know, of speaking of his own, uh, in his own ideas according, according to Master's teachings. Even in Master's teachings, you find fundamentalism. And people accused him of, of, oh, you're changing Master's teachings. And Swami was uh, countered that. He says, no, I've, he says, I've always, and it's true. This is what my observation of Swami was. He says, when it comes to the teachings and what Master said, I'm very conservative. That's true. I don't change. If Master said it, that's what he said. And the, te the techniques, he taught them exactly and presented them exactly. But as he was saying, he said, what we need to do, all of us, we have to bring those teachings alive in how are those teachings going to be expressed in a way that applies to people's lives and can uh, be put into action in people's lives. And so you need to be able to find ways to convey this to people. And so Swamiji, if you look at his books, 150 of them or so, you'll find that they all are talking really about the same thing. They're talking about Master's teachings mostly, and, but in a different way. He he takes e but each one, as he described it, were like spokes in a wheel that 
wherever on the wheel you find it on the periphery, you engage with it, you follow the spoke into the center. And that was, that was Master's teachings. And for Master's, for Master's words, what he spoke, he, and his techniques, he kept that very conservative. But he said it needs to be expressed in a new way to, to, because otherwise it becomes rigid. And it's not, people don't understand it intuitively from within. He says, and we must, spiritual teachings must be understood with the intuition, not with the, not, or you could say not only with the logical brain, you know, or the, that, that side. We have to, that is a beginning point. But really we have to go into the intuitive side and we then have to, Apply that sensitively with the heart into the modern age, into, the, into every age, and not, you could say, become locked. But nevertheless, that's something that the great ones bring. And because it's difficult to bring, they, they incarnate again and again to bring back that new expression. So Master, in his life, encountered fundamentalism. All of us encounter in that story, you know, you can master in the train, but in many other instances, he was in America in a very uh, conservative part of the country when he first went there. At that time, it was conservative, not so much anymore, but they, uh, and uh, elsewhere as well. He was, you know, he was often, he would, that one time he went to that revival meeting where uh, a very famous revivalist, conservative fundamentalist revivalist in the 1920s, uh, Amy McPherson was saying, everybody, I think it was that her at that one, everybody I want, you're all sinners, get down on your knees. And everybody in the audience, you know, dropped down on their knees, except Master. He said, and he says, I refuse. And he, you know, he was the only one standing. Now he had the courage to do that in a large auditorium. And he says, I refuse to get down on my knees and call myself a sinner. You know, I'm a child of God. And I'm, you know, and, and we're not, we shouldn't, and which was we shouldn't call ourselves sinners. But fundamentalists, you could say, you know, it's, oh, these, this is what you you do. And so he bucked that trend. Well, Swami also ran into this, like I mentioned, even his own work that happens. But he also, when he was in, when he was in uh, Italy, was it the bishop of Assisi that he went to talk to? He went, it was the bishop in Assisi, and the bishop is like in charge of all the priests and the diocese in that or that in that area. And uh, they were coming. He wanted to go see him because there was a little bit of uh, uh, difference, you might say, discord there, and they wanted to. I like Swami normally would, if somebody had a problem, he just went to him and talked to him and, uh, and tried to win him over. And he wasn't really able to win the bishop over. They, you might say, agreed to disagree. But, uh, uh, but, but Swami was, uh, you know, was asked if he was a Christian. And Swami says, yes, he was a Christian. I'm a Christian. I believe that Jesus was a great master, son of God, and div a divine incarnation of the divine. But... Did he believe, you know, that he was the only son of God, you know, the, the, a unique manifestation as the church defined it? And Swami did not. And so the, you know, because he had a more, I would think, to describe it as a more expansive view of what Christ was. He wasn't the only in that sense of unique physically in this relative world, but there, were many, there have been many sons of God and avatars. And, of course, the bishop would not accept him. He says, you can't call yourself a Christian. Well, of course, Swami says, Who, whose right is it <laughs> to, to, to say whether I can call myself a Christian or not? Certainly not the church's right to say that. One, if, it's one, if I love Christ, why not? I, can't, I can call myself. So as I say, they didn't come to a common understanding other than to agree to disagree. But it was that sort of attitude was something that was very prevalent, and it's still very prevalent. And uh, at least in, in, in that case, it wasn't a violent, <laughs> as it is in some parts of the world now. But you find that fundamentalism is something that is always going to be there. It's, it's rooted in a certain dogmatism. Dogmat Swami would define dogmatism. He said, dogmatism increases in direct proportion or indirect or in, in direct proportion 
how do I phrase this? In <laughs> dogmatism increases in, di in direct proportion to a person's inability to prove what they're trying to say. Did I get that relationship right? <laughs> in other words, if you don't know, the, if the more in doubt, the more person you can, the, the more you cannot prove your assertion, the greater the dogmatism. But dog, if you can prove, if you can test, if you can base what you're asserting on personal experience that some other person can replicate, the dogmatism goes down, you see, because you can test it. And so you find this throughout the ages. And again and again, the avatars come to tell us and to show us that we have to be able to interpret scripture, interpret and understand spiritual tradition. It's through the heart and through intuition, not through logic, you might say, and not necessarily through scripture. But that's not to say scripture's not right. But scripture needs to be interpreted intuitively, not necessarily literally. If you did it literally, we'd be in the dark age even right now because it, it doesn't make sense on that level. So I mentioned this as a, as a prelude because I wanted to, in, in Christ's time, I wanted to mention that he too came as an avatar. He came at a time also when he... Uh, to, be, to face dogmatism and fundamentalism. He came at a time when the Jewish tradition had become very uh, wedded to a literalism, a, an interpretation of ancient scripture, the Bible in this case, and very much, very much uh, uh, dogmatic in their beliefs of how one should approach the spiritual path. And it had very little to do with the spirit, you might say, or the, the, uh, the elements of the heart that was, would allow one to understand what the scriptures would say. And so he came at that time and faced the very same problems and ultimately he paid the price for that because of that, that fundamentalist reaction because he was trying to give a new expression to things that were true. There were truths based there, but yet he wanted to express them in a new way. And so this again and again is something that the, that the great ones, they encounter. Christ came, his coming, his birth, had been predicted uh, long before his coming. In the Bible, five, six hundred years prior to that, it had said, and the predictions had been made, that the prophets at that time had predicted that a Messiah would come. A, uh, to a Messiah, a, uh, uh, an anointed one, of what Christ, the word Christ means, anointed, uh, would come to deliver the sons of Israel or the children of, uh, of Israel into a promised land. Now, if you take that literally, which, which the, of course, the, you know, the Jewish, uh, the official word of uh, uh, priests of the tradition, they of course took that very literally, and so they were waiting for a Messiah to come to, in that case during Christ's time, to drive out the oppressors. Now the Messiah was supposed to come back to drive out the oppressors and to deliver the uh, children into the promised land where there would be no struggle and they, their, their peace would be found. Well, now, this has to be understood symbolically, you see. The Christ comes. The, the, the Christ comes to deliver us into this promised land. The inward, it's the inward message that's being said there, but people could not understand that. And so they, uh, and so they took it literally, because when they especially what ended up... Uh, eventually leading to his crucifixion was his statement that he was the Messiah. He implied that, and that was blasphemy uh, to consider people, because he, he gave implication that he was the Messiah, or, had, or was that one to bring them to that realization. But it was an inward realization that he was bringing, that, that inward upliftment of one's, one's consciousness that he was speaking of. But he came at, he came at as it is a fulfillment of that prophecy that had been made long before. But by the time Christ had come, they had, uh, 
the Palestine, that area of the world, had come under the rule of the Roman Empire. This was during the time of Caesar Augustus, probably the greatest of the Caesars and uh, of the emperors. And it, the, world, the empire had expanded very greatly at that time. And in Palestine at that time, the Romans had appointed a local king, and that was King Herod. He was a, a local, and he was the, under the supervision of the Roman Empire. He ruled in there. And at that time, uh, when the prophecies of the coming of the Messiah, that was always underneath the discussion amongst the Jews. They were always yearning for this Messiah to come back. And so consequently, the Roman emperors and the leaders were always on the lookout to put down any hint of rebellion amongst their subjects. And so when, as the story goes in the Bible, when the three wise men, three kings from the east, came inquiring in Jerusalem, of they had seen his star in the, in the east, and they were coming to uh, pay honor to this king that they had, that had, uh, uh, that had, had foretold. Now, this is the tradition, of course, the story, the tradition. And so they had come, they had seen this. And so Herod, hearing this, became very worried. He became very worried. He says, oh, something is, is amiss here, something's up. But the king, so these, and he sent them, he didn't know. They came asking, where is this king that has been born? And, he's, and Herod did not know, but he sent them forward. He says, go find them and when, find him. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I too can go and pay honor. And he was, so the king, those three wise men went and they followed the star. And then the story is they go then to Bethlehem. And Jesus had, and Mary had found themselves in Bethlehem because they had, it was been decreed that all citizens, they wanted to do a census at that time, that all citizens had to go back to their native place and be counted on the register so they could have a, a correct census of who was who and where they were. And so they had, they had originally been from Nazareth. This is why you hear Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth sometimes referred to. But, and so they were, they, but they, he were from Nazareth, but they were going back to where they were originally from, which would have been Bethlehem. So they went back to Bethlehem. And there, of course, Mary being pregnant, she then gave birth to Jesus. And then it was that traditionally they don't know what the day of the year that was, but it was historically later on the church set that day as the 25th day of, of December because it's the solstice time and the dark time of the year when now the light is rising. So it has symbolic effect and it, it competed with, you might say, the, the native uh, pagan rituals that they encountered. So it, it gave a counterpoint to that. Well, nevertheless, it, it that is uh, that is the day of his birth. It's set as that day. But then, uh, twelve days later, the wise men come and find Jesus. They didn't find him on that night. They twelve days later, and have you ever sing this song of the first day of Christmas, my true love? The dead, the twelve days of Christmas is a famous carol, and that's the twelve days between his birth and when the wise men finally come and find him, and they bring him gifts and they give him gifts and they follow that star that was in the east and they and so the story goes they found that and then from that they then of course they're they're in a dream they're warned not to go back and tell king herod where the king was born you know then because then they so they don't and they then leave it said they leave by some alternate route going back to where from where they came now these were these master Yogananda said these were these wise men were from India is how he explained it. They had come from the east and they had they had seen that star, that star in the east and and the east here being the in symbolic terms the spiritual eye and then through their intuition they were able to follow that star that light that appeared to them in in the spiritual eye, which was a symbol that when uh, they had interpreted it to mean that a great one, a great soul, a great master had descended 
into the world. And they, whether they could physically see that light, of course, that's outwardly, that's a debatable topic, you know, but, uh, but, uh, but that symbolically it means that they had, and they followed that, and that they had seen that this, this was a great master, you know, so, and that's why they came to do honor to them. And of course, Babaji or, or Yogananda said that actually those, his, uh, when he was explaining that, those were supposedly also the masters of our path, Babaji and Lahiri Mahasha and Sri Yukteswar had come from India. And it said later in Jesus's life that he returned that visit during those years when his, he's not mentioned in the Bible. Well, that's something. Master said it, so I tend to take it as truth, but it's not something that anybody can prove. But it certainly makes a nice, a nice additional story. But he, but they, they, they came, they paid honor, as, as the story says, and then they returned. Well, Herod, not hearing anything further, learned that the wise men had not returned and they had left. And so hearing the rumors that a king had been born, he decided, he, being a cruel man, uh, went into that area of the countryside and he ordered all the children to be that were less than two years of age to be killed. But Joseph, the uh, husband of Mary, had in a dream been told, flee, this is something terrible is going to happen. So he was told in a dream to flee. So before that could happen to them, they had fled to Egypt and they went they went to Egypt, and but then Herod came in, and all the children were destroyed at that time. Well, it was some time after that, of course, and Jesus comes back. So uh, they were uh, uh, in another dream. Some years later, Joseph is is said that it was after Herod dies. Some years later, he's told it's now he can return, and they come back to Palestine at that time and take up their home in Nazareth. Well, as uh, after the age of 12, there's no mention of Jesus anymore in the Bible. It very much abruptly ends until he's at the age of 30. And he then comes back, makes an appearance, and comes back to, uh, uh, to Israel or Palestine. And he appears. And that's where the Bible, when you read the Bible, the, most of the, the Gospels, that's where his story, his mission begins. He begins to come back to take up the mantle of, of fulfilling his mission. Where he's been, no one knows at, up to that time. Well, when he comes back, he makes an appearance. He comes back and he shows up that in his absence, there had arisen another great prophet in the, uh, that time, whose name was John. John uh, was, a, was a cousin of Jesus, just very slightly by a few months older than him, and, and John was a great prophet, was a great prophet and evangelist, and he he was uh, telling of the coming. There was something, someone greater than I is going to come. He was foretelling the coming of a great prophet, have not having ever met him, but uh, nevertheless he knew intuitively there was a great prophet coming, and he was telling people to prepare the way for the coming, to get ready, to repent, to cleanse yourself, purify yourself so that the, the prophet will come. And Jesus appears to, to John where he was at the water of the Sea of Galilee. He would baptize people in that, in, in water. And Jesus appears to him there and says, he asks John to baptize him. And John, of course, recognizes him. He sees, doesn't recognize him physically, but spiritually, he recognizes him, and he he asks Jesus. He says, "He says I'm not fit to 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 baptize you. You know, that you're, you know, just uh, even uh, uh, what's the sand, the, the phrase? There's this, I'm not fit even to tie your sandals because he can recognize the spiritual quality of Jesus. And, and Jesus says, he says, no, you must baptize. Him. Let it be so. Let it be so to fulfill righteousness' sake." And what Master was saying, interpreted that, and he says what John was saying is that John had been in a previous lifetime, Jesus' guru in a previous lifetime. John, and, John had been a great prophet in a previous lifetime and if in 
I think it was, must have been about 500 years prior. He was the prophet Elijah, who was historically one of the greatest of the prophets. And that, but Elijah, when Elijah dies in that lifetime, he had another, he had a very great disciple. And his disciple in that lifetime was a prophet called Elisha. And Elisha was a great prophet too, but, uh, but the story goes that Elisha would never let Elijah out of his sight because Elijah, he had, had Elijah had promised him that he, if he was with him in, in always, and especially at the time of his death, his mantle, which is a mantle, is, is, is a cloth, you know, that, like a shawl, but, that, but it's also symbolic in mantle, is my man, I pass my mantle to you, meaning his power. He says it would be passed on to double Elijah's power. And so Elijah always never let him out of his sight. <laughs> let him in, and so he's, till finally Elijah does pass, and, and he's, uh, in the story goes, he's taken up into, the, into heaven, into the light, uh, in bodily form. And uh, he, as, he's, as he's departing, he drops his mantle his onto, onto Elijah. And so Elijah, I've always, it doesn't, Master didn't say this. This is just Jaya saying this. Uh, but I've always thought that what it was is that Elijah probably knew or, uh, uh, that, or Elijah knew that Elisha would probably be destined for a world mission and gave his power to uh, Elisha. So his, his power increased, whereas perhaps his own power maybe went down a little bit. Because then they come back, and so Jesus sees him, and he asks to be baptized. And he says, no, let it be so, because this is for righteousness' sake. We need to do this. Because as guru and disciple, that relationship exists. Even though in that lifetime of John and Jesus, Jesus had excelled beyond John. So, so uh, John initiates, uh, initiates and baptizes Jesus in that life. And it was from that point that Jesus begins his mission. And his guru disciple relationship was reestablished in that lifetime. And then John is end up very shortly thereafter. He's, he's uh, assassinated, he basically by uh, uh, Inherit's court. But the, so then, mission, and, and Jesus continues his mission at that time. But if you read, if you read the Bible and the Gospels of uh, of, uh, of the disciple or John or Luke and Mark and Matthew and John, you see that what Jesus was trying to do was he was countering this fundamentalist, uh, dogmatic approach that religion had taken at that time. Master or Swamiji said that one of the it says the Jewish religion was a great religion, is a great religion because it, in those days especially in its early days that that it had something in common that was basically unique to only two traditions, one was the Jews, and the other was in the Vedic tradition. He says in the one God is one. You see, which was not common. People didn't think that way. God is one. Now, the Jews, or you could say the Vedic tradition, is this, not only is God one, but God is also manifest in his creation. And he says, and that's a little higher, because the Jews says God is one, but he's not necessarily in creation as well. And that's a little bit lesser understanding. But nevertheless, that sense of the oneness of God is something that was shared by these two traditions, you see, unique in that way. And so he came, Jesus came to revitalize that, but we have to understand that in the spirit. And so Moses gave 10 commandments, and that was necessary, and rules. He gave a, the Torah in, in Jewish tradition is the rules that, that of how we should live our life, very thick, hundreds of them, of the rules. And it was necessary at that time because they were a nomadic pagan tribe. In Jesus' time, he only gave two rules, two commandments. Two commandments. Was the first was, you should love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind. That is, and as he said, Jesus said, that is the great commandment. And second onto it is, Love thy neighbor as thyself. 
And everything else fell upon those two commands. He only gave those two. Love, love God and love your fellow man as your very own self. Because he is yourself. We're no different. It's just where God is manifested equally in each of us. And so he tried this. And so from that, his teachings and his mission was to, was to infuse intuitive understanding and spirit. God was, in, is God was, or the Sabbath, the holy day, they were the literal or the fundamentalist uh, ritualistic approach to that is they couldn't do anything on the day. I literally had to stay inside your house practically, do nothing except, you know, except worship God, which was a good thing. But uh, he was, and so Christ and his disciples were criticized for doing something on the Sabbath day. And Christ said, the Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath. And you need to bring common sense in, into, into this. And so in much of his teachings were to infuse the ancient traditions with an intuitive sense and also to bring heart into it. Heart, compassion, love, understanding, forgiveness of somebody. And this is illustrated by, you know, uh, there, the lady was going to be stoned who, because she was an adulteress. And they were about to stone her. And he, he got in front of her and he says, I ask all of you, those of you who are pure and have never sinned, to be the one to throw the first stone. And of course, nobody, you know, they, they all backed down after that. But he was trying to bring in a different uh, 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 softness to what was a very hard, hard edged uh, tradition at that time. And so he brought, he tried to bring this and particularly to bring the element of love God. Now it said, Master said that to his close disciples, he also taught techniques of how to do this. But to the masses who were unprepared for that, he basically spoke through parables and stories and through inspirational devotional practices. And for in the end, of course, he ended up being crucified because he was saying, this is, this is a new dispensation. And because of that, uh, he breaking the fundamentalist rules, he ended up being crucified. It was interesting going back, there was one story in the Bible where he goes up to Mount Tabor, which is a mountain there. And it's, it's a, it's a, episode in his life called the transfiguration where he's there praying and he becomes body becomes suffused with light and he begins to shine and he's there with a few of his disciples and his body begins to shine and the disciples see him in this light shining in this light and there on one side of him two figures appear one on either side the first was Moses on one side and Elijah on the other his guru from the past life, you see, his guru from they they appear on both sides of him, and so he, he so his mission takes him till finally he is, he is, uh, he is crucified, but then, this is just in a sense from the Christian religion point of view, this is really where the religion of Christianity begins. Of course, is when he dies. He he's, he passes, reappears to his disciples after this crucifixion, Easter, and appearing to his disciples, and his disciples disperse and go out. Now his twelve minus one Judas <laughs> being uh, be, uh, disciples go out, and people have asked in the in after that he says, you know, I'm not sure. Did Jesus really exist or didn't he exist? He's just a myth, or is he a figure in history? And this question comes up because there's no historical first-hand account of his ever, ever living. And the thought that occurred to me is this, and this occurred to me when I went to Chennai I, I, just a few years ago. I went to Chennai, and they have a, there's a nice church there where uh, Thomas uh, uh, was supposed to be, have been martyred there, whether it was there or some other spot, and nobody knows exactly, but he's, Tradition says he was there. They made a nice church. And in the church uh, cathedral, there's these alcoves, and each one is dedicated to a certain disciple and gives their biography of what happened to him. And I didn't, I didn't know this, actually, until I went to that church, is that uh, I read each one, and out of the 11, 
minus Judas, 12 minus Judas, out of the 11, 10 of them were martyred, were killed for their belief at diff in all parts of the world, you know, because they, they, just, they just went out. And they, they all carried this message of Christianity, of Christ's life, to different parts of the world. And every one of them was martyred, except for one, and that was John, who ended up being exiled on an island somewhere in the Mediterranean, Patmos. And he ended up dying there in exile. But they were, and so I thought about that, and I thought, what would motivate these fellows, 12 men, to leave everything, to leave everything and go out and dedicate their lives to, to the point of being killed, finally, for their beliefs, that something must have been at the center of that to motivate them to that degree. So, that, so although historically there's no written record, there is a historical record of these, these men going out. And so something was there to propel them, that explosion, and it went out. Now, one of, the, one of the most influential of his disciples was Paul, the Apostle Paul. But now Paul was not one of the original disciples. He came to Jesus after Jesus was killed. And he, in a, Jesus appeared to him in a vision. But he was so moved, he was actually an oppressor of the early Christians, uh, martyring others. And, but he had this conversion experience, and he became the greatest of the, of the apostles or the disciples going out in the sense of being carrying that mission out. He became uh, the person that went out throughout the Roman world at that, much of it at that time, uh, and began to form congregations of, of believers, and he began to expound these tradition of Christianity. And it was through him that ultimately the, the Christian church began, or the Catholic church began to, to form. But it didn't, in that early days, this went out, there was a great spirit with this, and there was, a, there was a sense of fluidity to it, of intuitiveness, of mysticism to it, of inwardness to it, but slowly, as uh, the way Swami phrased it, he said, slowly the tendency of, of, of uh, literalness, of fundamentalism, of, of scriptural authority, and he says, uh, began to take hold. And especially one of the most impactful things to happen to that early, those early Christian teachings is it became adopted by the Roman Empire. The uh, Emperor Constantine, about 300 years later, or 250 to 300 years after Christ's time, had a vision, and he ad established, adopted Christianity as the state religion. Now, this, in some ways, people think, oh, well, that's good. It is good if you're an organizational man. <laughs> and, and the Romans were very organized, and they were very organized, very uh, establishment, and that you could say is the beginning of the Catholic Church. The Church really begins to become formal when it became the, the Church or the religion of the Empire because basically everything that the Romans had been doing before, they just substituted Jesus Christ in there and it became rigid, started from there really to become more rigid. And at the same time, as, uh, as uh, the way of thinking at that time was, was although the outward expression was Roman, the intellectual side of it was Greek, and the Greeks were very, very logical, very logical. And logic, the logic and civic administration and efficiency began to encompass the, Catholic, the church at that time, and the inner you might say the intuitive side began then to go down. Now, historically, you look back at this and you say, well, maybe it was necessary because it was a time of descending Kali Yuga at that time, going into very dark ages. And it, and it is probably true that the values were maintained by that organizational structure through the dark ages of the you know, until finally you start coming back out of those dark ages. But nevertheless, it, in that process of that, it became very rigid and formalized, and it began to lose 
its uh, intuitive, uh, you might say, this mystical side of it. And that continued and through. And this is why last night Aditya talked about St. Francis, why St. Francis was a very revolutionary person in the Catholic Church, because he brought heart. He brought, he brought, the, he brought the sense of joy, the spend, the, of spontaneity, of heart, of simplicity. He brought all of these things back to the church, and it had this, it had this explosion of spirituality began to take place in, in, between him and a number of other great saints that arose in the in that area of the world at that time. They began to it, they began to flower, and the church itself began to revive itself at that time. But by and large, it it's relatively it was still very much caught up into a fundamentalist uh, doctrine. There was a very technologically things were beginning to advance as well, starting to come, as Sri Teshwar said, into the Dwapara Yuga. And probably one of the most uh, impactful inventions that happened a, a few centuries after Francis was something that, in it, that had, an, had a great impact was the printing press. It was developed. And with the printing press, what you had is the ability to reproduce the Bible for the common man at that time in Europe and in the West. And with the, and the Bible, which was in the one sense, it was good because it, it allowed people to have firsthand knowledge rather than the intermediary of a priesthood. But what happened, the Bible began to take the place. You see, it was the Bible was put on the altar, the written word, as recorded, you know, by the or in, or as or as translated by whoever it was uh, in, in the English world, it was James Saint James or James's Bible. Well, King James, the that becomes the word, and still to this day, in America at least, fundamentalism is defined by a literal interpretation of what those words say in that Bible, and if. And, to sometimes to very ridiculous degrees, and it doesn't make any sense at all. The, uh, you know, the uh, uh, there's that story of of uh, master. Uh, there's a thing in in the old days, uh, in the early days, in the in the days of the I think it was the flood, Noah's flood. There was there was great gnashing of teeth, gnashing, and you know, or or no, when you if you die and you go to and you go into purgatory into hell, there will be great gnashing of teeth. And um, uh, how does that story go? And, and, and uh, I forgot the punchline. But that, but then Master asked the lady. He says, "Well, what if you don't have any teeth?" You know, and then, <laughs> and he says, "Well, in heaven you'll be. If you go to heaven after you die, you will be given teeth." <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's exactly how they were, uh, how they interpreted it. It's like the, the other lady, uh, or the, uh, uh, there was a philosopher at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it was believed that the world existed on a, um, uh, the world was resting on a turtle. You know, that was the belief. There's a big turtle, and the, re and the world, physical world, is resting on, a, on the top of a turtle shell. That made no sense, you know. So the so this the philosopher was was talking about how you know you have to understand these things on something less than a literal, you know, a literal interpretation. And he says, and uh, he says, for example, the turtle. And so the a lady comes up to him and say, after the words and says, no, 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 you know, the world is on a resting on a turtle. So the philosopher says, uh, well, what is the turtle standing on? <laughs> and and she says another turtle <laughs> and the philosopher says well what is that turtle standing on and she says it's no use it's turtles all the way down <laughs> <laughs> and he was saying how can you argue with such people and you, you can, there's no hope to arguing with such people and this this sort of tradition is, is, is a, a classically very fundamentalist. You can't until, but finally, s history, society, the, the evolution of time forces 
things to change. Well, while this was taking place, also there were some people in the Christian tradition who did try to get back to the original understanding. And those were usually people in the monasteries. There was no place for them out in the outer world. And so you did find people who wanted God, who wanted to love God with all thy mind, all thy heart, all thy soul. And they really sincerely knew that there was something more. But the only place for them, not in society, they had to retreat to the monasteries. And so you found some great saints would arise in the monasteries who did have a deeper tradition. But as Master explained it, and or at least the Swamiji explained, he says, unfortunately, this is, well, this is one of the problems that happened in the West, that these traditions were not encouraged. You'd have a great saint, like let's say a Teresa of Avila, who Master said was in his line, you might say, his, in his tradition. And, and uh, uh, she, she was a great saint, but yet she left, really didn't leave a disciplic line of people following because she didn't pass it on in an organized fashion to a line of disciples. And many great saints were like that. So they would rise up, but then no tradition would be descended from them. Whereas in India, or in the, in the East in general, the honoring of the guru-disciple relationship has allowed the culture, and particularly to the spiritual culture, to be passed down from ancient times. This is why we read at the beginning of the autobiography that the two things that have sustained the Indian culture through thick and thin have been the mankind's search for eternal verities, the truths, and the, the disciple guru relationship has sustained the tradition in the Vedic from Vedic times, but that didn't happen in the West because there was no tradition that was allowed to be be uh, if a person was set themselves up as a teacher like that, they were transferred somewhere else. I met a Swami met, and I also met a man who was uh, I don't know if he was a, you classify him as a saint, but he certainly was saintly. Uh, his, uh, it was Father Ignatius, and I, I met him, and he was, I was very impressed with him. And Swami, uh, you know, referred to him somewhat as a saint. And, and he was in Los Angeles, and so I went and met him, and he was, I, well, I was very impressed with him too. And a uh, uh, he, very gracious man. The, but he, what happened, he was becoming known uh, as a saint in Los Angeles at that time. And so what the, the church didn't like it. They transferred him. They sent him some little, some little town in Spain. And that's where he I probably ended up his life there because they didn't want him to be, they thought, oh, that's just ego. You know, that's just ego. So we know, you know, if they put that down or, or people were going to him, well, that was the real problem. They were going to him, Father Ignatius, and they weren't going to the priests in their own church. You see, the idea that you can just create a priest by sending him to school and, and having him do the rituals makes all priests equal. It's the idea because it's Christ that is being transmitted. But all priests are not equal. Some are holy. And when holiness appears, it has a magnetism. And people began to come to him. And so people were flocking to his church and abandoning the other churches. So they transferred him. Now, I thought that was kind of sad. I thought, yeah, but, uh, but I don't know. But that, that, that began to, that tradition uh, or lack of a guru, uh, an honored guru-disciple tradition was also there. And so you find that this, this had become the, in, to modern times, the uh, state of the Christian church and the Christian religion. And, it, and again, you find dogmatism happening, fundamentalism happening. And so this, when you read the story in the autobiography of a yogi of Christ appearing to Babaji, saying the, 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 uh, the, the lights on the high altar of my church, of inner the light of inner communion, God communion, are, are burning low and are ill attended. Let us together, united in Christ's love, set lights ablaze again on that, on that high altar. Uh, uh, and what was being substituted was 
The noble are the tapers of good works, which are good, but they're second, you see. Good works, outward expression of virtue, uh, of being uh, uh, good, is, is a good moral compass for society, but something more is needed, which is that higher teaching. And so Christ came back, and, or came in this case to Babaji and asked him to send somebody to help revive that tradition of inner communion love of God. And so this is, Master came to the West, or he went to the West, with that mission specifically to, to bring back that element and to give a new expression of Christianity, in the sense, but not Christianity really, of truth. And he, so he came back to bring those truths into that Western tradition that in this age, as Babaji had, and the great masters have predicted, that uh, India specifically and the West ultimately would unite spiritually. One, the best of one being balanced by the best of another. Because there's no doubt that the Western culture has been successful in outward efficiency and technology in this particular historical age. And that is useful, it's helpful, but at the same time it needs to be infused with what the East has been good at, which is, is developing that tradition of individual inner communion with God that's based upon intuitive understanding. And right now, I see in the world, you see a world in turmoil right now because this change, and I think much of it instituted by simple culture change, societal change, historical changes, the world is speeding up, the introduction of the Dwapara Yuga into the world, coming, the world coming into Dwapara Yuga now. Master responding to that, the great masters bringing teaches, teachings in Kriya Yoga that are attuned with these historical changes are putting great pressure in the world today. And people, I'm an optimist, you see, I'm an optimist. People see, oh my gosh, look at all the terrible things that are happening. And that's true, there are difficult things happening in the world today. But it's because pressure for change is being put. And these things, Christ, there's a story of Christ when he went to Jerusalem. People think of him as very meek and mild. But he went into the temple and he, and he took a, a lash and he drove out the money changers out of the temple. Because, you know, just in, in uh, driving, he says, you're, dis you're, you're desecrating this temple. And he drove them out. So he, he wasn't meek and mild in that way where truth was concerned. And so it's the same thing, is we're finding a wave of spirituality, an, un a deeper understanding of spirituality that is coming into the world today. And I, it's putting great pressure on, uh, a pre pressure for change to happen. And so I feel that Master's prediction that yes, the world has to go through tumultuous times, which we're seeing. We're seeing these tumultuous times we're seeing in, in the newspapers every day. We must go through tumultuous times, but he said, once we go through these tumultuous times, people will inevitably come to a deeper understanding that faith must be based upon direct experience of divine and that highest of commandments of to love thy Lord with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. And the second one, love thy neighbor as thyself. You could see those two are embodied in the East, India, is that first direct communion with God. That's the first commandment. That's the one missing one, in the, really, in the Christian tradition. It's not missing. It's just not emphasized, you see. It's, not, it's just not emphasized. And, but the second one has been emphasized. That's the path of the West. Love thy neighbor as thyself. It's a very Christian. That's the Christian tradition, expressing it through outward action and, being, you know, and, and outwardly uh, including uh, everybody as your brothers and, and sisters and, and doing something about it. So that outer action plus that first one, which is the, the, because it's first, it's the higher of the two, because without that, you don't have a proper foundation. Your action just becomes merely good karmic action, 
but we want to go beyond just sattvic action into doing something that's an expression of, uh, of seeing beyond the duality of I am different from everybody else, because we are brothers and sisters all one in God. And in this, this is the message that Master brought, and this is why Christ came to do, to do something in a very similar, but in his unique way, 2,000 years ago, but Master coming back, doing something very similar again, bringing in a new expression of intuitive understanding approach, with, but this time with tools. And this is the, the role of Kriya Yoga in this time, with tools to be able to have that inner communion. Said that Jesus brought tools for his disciples, but not the world wasn't ready to be able to, and as the age was such that we're not ready to hear uh, of for the masses. But yet now we're entering into an age when that when the masses themselves will become ready. Every I feel, and this is if you read uh, Sri Yukteswar's book, The Holy Science, and he actually says it this way too. We're entering into a new age. And every generation that comes is going to be a bit more aware than the past one because we're in this upward. I, I'm impressed with young people generally. I just, I just say, my gosh, if I would have been that aware, you know, if I'd have known as much as they did when they, at their age, you know, uh, what could I have done, you know? But I, and now maybe that's fanciful, but uh, but I, I like to think of it that way. And, and I think Sri Teshwar was saying that too, that we're. There's a, an, a greater awareness of light is coming in to the world in this age. And all of us, it's our task to be a part of that, to be emissaries of that light. And so we celebrate that. When, and I think Christmas, not just Christmas, but every culture has some celebration of light. Isn't it so? I think uh, certainly, in, certainly in the Indian tradition that's so. But I, I don't know enough of other traditions, but I suspect everyone understands that light is the essential reality, and we celebrate that light. And in the Christian tradition, that light is expressed through Christmas. And I'm five minutes over. <laughs> anyway, uh, I just had this, I had this professorial uh, uh, some scar to just do a little history lesson today. So <laughs> forgive me if history was not your favorite subject. Anyway, many blessings. And tomorrow or tomorrow we'll have our experience, our practice of these. You see, talking is one thing, practice is another. So come back tomorrow and we'll have an all-day meditation. Many blessings. <laughs>